Uh, good afternoon. Man, I'm really excited to be in uh, Oakland, California uh, with my Oakland fam that I've met, some of that I haven't. Uh, we're really excited there are people here from all over the country uh, who are uh, really are the work, right? Like are the people who are you know, fighting for our communities, communities of color all over this country and, and, and have an analysis and understanding around why uh, boys and young men of color uh, uh, are, are a population that, that, that matter, um, that, 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 that have worth, that have value that we should be fighting for, not in a way that is uh, more than um, uh, women and girls of color, more than other identity groups, but, but, but it's worth naming uh, a population that we feel like that society sees uh, as less than they are, less than we are. Uh, and so, one, I just really want to thank all of you for your work, uh, for your commitment, for uh, 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 being examples and models for, for me and for us, for colleagues all over this country in what uh, movement really means. Uh, and so today and this evening, we are going to uh, launch and, and, and start this conversation and start this uh, uh, venue. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the venue tomorrow and, like, and, and, and what some of our goals and our hopes and, and some of the design elements and what, what we think matters and hear some from you of what you think matters. But, but we wanted to kick off uh, uh, this, 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 this uh, important three days uh, in hopefully a different way. Uh, we really wanted to, 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 to really uh, frame this work around boys and men of color around morality and ethics, the, the, the moral imperative. And I think oftentimes uh, we uh, uh, take the, the talking points of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, and I won't even say, I mean, we take the talking points of, of, of uh, certain populations, whether that's uh, the conservative right, whether that is uh, uh, you know, uh, different institutions and people who are uh, raising up or holding up the barriers for boys and young men of color for, op for those opportunities. We, 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 we take their talking points and, and concede those notions and those talking points as theirs. Uh, we actually don't think we talk about morality enough. Uh, we don't talk about morality, we don't talk about ethics, uh, because sometimes that's a strong talking point of, 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 of the very folk who are lifting up the systems we're trying to combat. But today we want to center our conversation, center these few days around morality, around ethics, and what is the moral imperative for fighting for a, 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 a opportunities and, and, and a future and a present reality for boys and men of color in this country. Uh, and so we're really excited uh, to, 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 to have that conversation and have some conversation leaders. And so the, the, the conversation will go in this way. Uh, we're gonna have uh, two of our speakers uh, come and share for uh, about seven minutes. One will share and then the other will share and then we will open it up for questions and dialogue and discussion. Uh, and then we'll wrap that up uh, and then ask the other two speakers to come uh, and each of them bring their own perspective and we'll introduce each, uh, not with uh, a, a, a long bio because you can check the website or look in your, 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 your program, but, but giving you a frame for what they're gonna talk about and hopefully afterwards we can wrestle with it and consider it and think about how we can ground our work and not be scared to lead with a frame of morality and ethics. Uh, 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 for, for our work. And so I'd love to just first just bring up um, uh, uh, Pastor Michael McBride uh, and also Jerry, if you could come up as well and, and, and have a seat. And uh, Pastor McBride is gonna start with a conversation around the morality of reforming systems and followed by Jerry Tello who will talk about the morality of memory. Pastor McBride. All right, it is a great blessing to be here. If you are glad to be in the house, give your neighbor a high five and tell them thank you for sitting next to me, all right? Let's... So I, I, will, I will quickly move to my remarks. Um, I am a preacher and I can easily become intoxicated with the exuberance of my own verbosity and I... <laughs> 
If there is any moral imperative, I believe it must flow out of the love and the aspiration we share for our young people, our loved ones, uh, who have been given to us as a gift. I often say that young people do not ask to come here. Children uh, do not make a request to be born. As a matter of fact, it is uh, adults and other folk in many respects who are actually bringing children into a world they have very little control over. And I am certainly someone who continues to find this moment in time a very promising moment, but also a very challenging moment because I continue to be reminded how with all the great work that is happening, we still are not moving fast enough. I was uh, very much excited when we uh, brought a number of our uh, impacted populations from incarcerated leaders, clergy, young people, moms. We brought them to Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago to bring our own recommendations around the My Brother's Keeper initiative. And we had some very important conversations with a number of different policymakers, both at the White House and the philanthropy community. Um, and on my way back home, uh, on a very extreme high, Soon as I touched down back here in the Bay Area, uh, preparing for uh, my sermon on the next day, uh, I was made aware that two of my teenagers had been shot. One had been shot in the face and the other had been shot in his leg. And as I visited with him on that Sunday morning uh, before I went to preach uh, in my congregation and I looked at his face and saw the trauma that the bullet had caused uh, as it ripped through his face, <clears throat> I was reminded that the stakes are so much higher than winning a campaign or winning a policy remedy, but we are fighting for the very lives and the future of our families, our neighborhoods, and those who have been given to us as a gift. So part of what I believe the moral imperative requires is for us to always remember that our systemic and structural work has to uh, reach a level of sophistication where we are able to really impact and transform not just individuals, but structures. I was certainly uh, reminded of a very powerful passage of scripture that uh, I grew up in a Pentecostal holiness tradition, and I used to hear this preached all the time, and it said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, wickedness in high places. And I always grew up thinking I was fighting against, you know, Satan, the devil, the boogeyman. I, I, I still fight against him from time to time. Somebody say amen, right? <laughs> but I also am reminded that there are also structures that the writer was talking about, that requires our attention as well. So part of what I believe any real moral imperative that attempts to dismantle structures that harm our communities must be able to do it on a multi-level, uh, comprehensive base, because I have come to know and believe that disorganized truths cannot defeat an organized lie. And the problem is not about if we know the truth or what is right to do. The challenge is for all of us in the movement work, in the neighborhoods and communities we serve, to become more organized around what we know can save a generation of young people and families that have been given to us as a gift. So we believe that any effort to actually dismantle these structures require a proclamation, a policy strategy, and a menu of programs. When we talk about proclamation, we take seriously that our narrative, our shared narrative, the way in which we talk about our communities, the way in which we talk about our loved ones, our young men, our, our, our older men, our young women, our older women, our families, our communities, that we must develop a compelling narrative 
that widens the circle of concern and that reminds all of us that we have been created in the image of God and we share a humanity that cannot be diminished by the color of our skin or our social location. We must develop a proclamation that challenges us to remember that we belong to one another. And if we belong to one another, then our fates lie together. And in our fates lying together, I cannot be free when my brother or my sister is not free. What does it mean then to bring that proclamation into a public space to challenge the dominant discourse that makes the structural realities of exclusion even possible? Proclamation then is about us publicly declaring the truths of who we are and shifting hearts, minds, and the public will to move into what I call next policy reform. That words pass away, but policies, when institutionalizing the very values and the words we aspire to see a reality, policies help institutionalize those words in ways that live beyond the speaker of those words. Policies help, they help really uh, make transparent what our values are. That if our policies are reflected in our budgets, then we will know what our priorities are. That budgets are indeed moral documents. And we can't say we want to support our communities when we are not funding and robustly making sure that all the resources necessary are there to support them. And then finally, programs help us to then appreciate how do we deliver the policy solutions into local communities that are able to take what we know works and build it to scale. What does it mean for us, as we've been able to do in a number of cities across the country, to use policy and programmatic remedies to reduce gun violence by 30, 40, 50, 60 percent in less than 18 months. Pulling those young people, those men, out of their conditions, not because we're so great, but because every young man that I've met, when you talk to them long enough, they all want to live free. They want to live free from violence. They want to live free from trauma. They want to live free from exclusion. They want to live free from incarceration. What then does it mean for us to be the amplifiers of their voice? Not our own, but their voice. What does it mean for us to bring them into the highest places of decision making that they have access to? Structural reform requires we who have power with institutions to be brought to bear because we believe that power respects power. As an individual, I cannot shift a structure on my own, but my institution, when aligned, coordinated, and collaborative, can dismantle the very structures that bring death rather than life into our communities. This is our sacred work, and it is my prayer that we will not retreat from the moral imperative, but we will lean into it together. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank the Creator and uh, all my ancestors and all those that have come before that have paved this way that have uh, sacrificed and struggled and, and cried and, and bled so that we would have an opportunity like this. Sometimes in our journey, we forget. We forget that before this time, there was a time that once upon a time, we had ancestors and we had communities and we had people that gathered together we gathered together with love and harmony. We gathered together with tradition and values. And even my family, my family that came from Aguascalientes and, and Chihuahua, that came from San Antonio, we ended up in Compton and in Watts. We ended up in a community that was black-brown community, but even in that community that they said was 
dysfunctional and downtrodden and high risk. In that community, I saw love and I saw dignity. I saw my grandmother get up early, early in the morning, sometimes 5 o'clock in the morning. I thought my grandmother was crazy. Why did you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning? But she would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning before she'd do anything. Before she'd eat, brush her teeth, do anything, she'd go and we had a little altar, a little altar in our house, and she'd go there and she'd kneel there. And she'd stand and she'd connect. And she'd connect with the spirit of the creator. And, and you could almost do an assessment of how many problems we had because the more problems we had, the longer she stayed on there. But after she finished, she'd get up. And she'd come to the room where we were sleeping and she'd bless all of us. She'd bring us that energy of the ancestors and the memory of those that came before us and the dreams and the hopes of all those ancestors that struggled and fought and bled and cried and wept and, and she brought those hopes to us and blessed us. And at 5.30 in the morning, I didn't think it was a blessing. I thought it was a nuisance. Well, Grandma, why are you waking me so early? Can't you bless me later? Isn't God around later? And I didn't understand. I didn't understand what my grandmother's worries were. What she had struggled through, what she had seen go on in her own life, what she had seen go on with the relatives. Let us not forget the path of our ancestors and the struggle and the trauma that has come to them. Let us not forget that many of our great grandmothers and great grandfathers were whipped and tortured and were separated from their families and separated from their children. Not for them doing any wrong, but for them looking the way they looked. Or for a judgment that was made on who they are. Or for not having papers that made them legal. And those grandmothers and grandfathers suffered wounds that were very deep. And I saw those very wounds in my father. My father that tried to raise us in a good way. And I see those wounds today in little boys that are angry. Little boys that had four angry. And they're so angry they can't sit still and their leg moves like this and the teacher says, sit still, Tommy. But he can't sit still and he's trying to sit still and, and they said, I'm going to give you time out. Okay, sorry, teacher. And he's trying to sit still, but the anxiety and the and the. And the unresolved hurt and the question about why do people treat me like that, I'm not doing anything wrong, sits within him and comes without him. And we categorize those little boys and we want to drug them up and we want to give them time out. And some of them are in permanent time out, locked up. But where are the grandmothers? Where are the grandfathers? We must be those grandmothers and grandfathers. Because we can send children to school and we can educate them. But if they forget who they are, if they don't know their traditions and their customs and their roots that hold strong trees even in a strong wind, then we will lose the battle. It is real important for us to recognize that, yes, there's trauma in our past, but there's also blessings. There's blessings and there's traditions and there's customs and there's ways, and even I saw it in Compton. My little grandma, little, little grandma, she'd make food, and when it was lunchtime, she'd come out, pues, ¿quién quiere comer? All of us wanted to eat, and, including my friend Tyrone, who I thought didn't speak Spanish, but he raised his hand like that. <laughs> she says, pues, pasale, mico, and he, went, he walked in. Where did he learn Spanish? There's no ESL classes. And he walked in, pues, siéntese, mico, and he sat down. Because in those traditional ways, all the kids are your kids doesn't matter race or color or anything like that. All the children are your children. And my grandmother sat him down at the table and fed him too. But he had to follow our rules, so he had to say a prayer. And even though he may not have known what my grandmother was saying, she prayed for him too. And when we went, went to Tyrone's house, his grandmother was there. He, he didn't have a little grandma. He had a big grandma. And Miss Mosley didn't call me Miko. She went, baby, come here, baby. And I thought I was a big boy, but you didn't mess with Miss Mosley. And she said it a different way. She said, bless you, child. She blessed me too. We must recognize that the wounds of our children, of these young men, 
are deeper than any program. They're deeper than, than any analysis. They're deeper than any intervention. Sometimes they're so deep and so wide that we have to reach for the grandmother's blessings. We have to reach for the grandfather's blessings. We must reach for our traditions and our ways that go way, way back beyond the wounds, beyond the torture. And we must be willing to embrace every child in the way they are. And some come bald head, tattooed down, all looking hard. But even them, they need a blessing. And sometimes we look at programs and think they're effective because of what they do. Father G over here talks about jobs, but nobody sees the blessings and the hugs unless you go there. It's important that we reclaim our youth, that we bring them back and reintegrate them into who they really are based on their traditional self, based on their sacred self. So when my grandmother blessed me, she says, you are sacred just the way you are. And when we left the house, she would say, portese bien, behave. What it really meant is everything you do affects all of us. That interconnected spirit we must call back. We must call back among all our communities. Whatever race, nationality, whatever focus that we have, we must reclaim that sense of, in our language, we say, in cloque nawake, which means interconnected sacredness. And when we get to that point and recognize that, we must recognize that the children that come before us, that can't sit still, that sometimes react angry, hateful, sometimes self-hateful, sometimes they need a blessing. And sometimes they need somebody to hold them. And sometimes they need somebody to reclaim them. And sometimes they need somebody to embrace them. And sometimes they just need somebody to bless them. Because in them is the sacredness of their ancestors. And the sacredness and the values and the traditions of who we are. We must make sure as we do this movement, we don't forget who we are. That education in an institution is not enough. We must bring the education of the ancestors and the elders so that we don't have children that only have degrees, but they know how to treat a grandma and how to treat a grandma, grandpa, and know how to treat the children. They must recognize that just because you succeed doesn't mean you succeeded. You must reach back and reach up and pull through and bring those ancestors with them to the next generation. I want to thank all of you for the work that you do and the blessing that you bring to this next generation. Make sure every day you bless that child. Thank you, Pastor McBride. Thank you, Jerry. Um, we're going to open up for questions. We're going to start uh, off with a question for, from one of our two um, uh, speakers in the next segment, and then we'll open it up for others. Darnell? Just raise your hand and someone will bring you the microphone. So you all know Father G made me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really appreciate both of your remarks, and I'm interested in hearing more about how do we take the cultural practices that you're talking about, right? Um, spiritual practices even, and how do you make those translate in really bona fide, tangible ways and programs, and policy? How do we take these ethics that you're bringing up, love, care, community, and make them mean something in ways that actually produces change? Well, I think we are not left without examples mm. of how uh, people have taken eternal principles of faith, or at least practices of faith, and used them as a weapon rather than a bridge. So part of what I think we must continue to challenge ourselves to do is to not become so seduced with uh, the kind of popular expressions or uh, really uh, a, uh, uh, um, simplified notions of how faith is used in a public sphere, but, but actually look at our own practices within our own faith traditions and see how do we indeed practice that which we speak about? And some of the work that we've been able to do, we look at the structures of our faith 
traditions as they already exist. Many of us gather weekly already. So we've started things like Sabbath events. We call them Live Free Sabbaths, where we train clergy and congregations how to preach, to pray, and to act. Where we actually train clergy leaders how to talk about issues related to those who are most uh, impacted and give them a message of healing, a message of inclusion, a message that they then can reverberate from their pulpits during their times of worship. We teach them how to actively widen their circle of concern and engagement by standing in a place of empathy through prayers and through uh, solidarity walks in the communities. And then we also invite them to act, to create a policy agenda that is very clear around dismantling these structures as they exist and invite them to do uh, concrete acts of engagement, whether it is voting, calling your elected official, uh, participating in local uh, meetings that are actually impacting the structures. We believe that these kinds of practices already exist. The structures are already there. The question is, can we have the creativity in our minds and an imagination to redeem these structures and unleash the power of people uh, in their own faith traditions to act more justly in a public space? Uh, a little over 25 years ago, uh, a number of us men uh, came together because we were very bothered by what was going on with our youth. And we didn't see systems or programs that were responding to our youth. And we came together in a retreat and we, we began with a prayer, but we, we began with, with palabra, with dialogue. And very quickly we found out that, uh, that we were trying to do programming for the youth, but we were all messed up. That we had our own issues. That many of the men in that circle were not relating well with their children or didn't have good relationships with their partners, uh, had wounds from their fathers and from their mothers. And, and so what we quickly realized is that we had to do our own healing. The second thing we realized is our best tool with the young people was our example, that we needed men that could stand in an honorable way, that knew how to honor relations, that knew how to live traditions, that knew how to be that example, so that young people could see what honorable men look like that we had to, to commit to that. And we had to commit to that, not in programs, and not when we were at work, but 24-7. We had to commit to be that in our homes. We had to commit to be that in our communities. We had to commit to be that with each other. And so what we did is return to an old tradition, an extended kinship network. That's what we, that's what we did before. Before, everyone was a relative. Mm. And so that extended kinship network we call the compadres. And in our culture, in every culture, there was that, that sense of extended kinship. And so we gather and we have gatherings and we have now ex ex extended that all across the nation. And we gather with young men. We're creating healing circles in juvenile institutions and in, in high schools and in communities. And you see these young people after they get used to it, rather than fight, they say, hey, dude, let's circle up. Dude, let's circle up. Mm -hmm. Something's going on. And now they begin to understand their authentic self again. Because what's happened in this, this whole process of, be, of racism and oppression, many young people think based on their wounds, based on their oppressed self. And the way that you bring that around is you must be the example for them. You must show the example. So we have a, an, an effort called the Healing Generations effort that we're asking elders to speak up, tell the stories, share the wisdoms of the ancestors because they're there. We're asking fathers to stand up and step up. And even fathers that incarcerate. I was in Soledad prison last year and I spoke to 200 men. And I asked them, how many of you are fathers? They all raised their hand. I said, how many of you love their kids? They all raised their hand. I said, how many of you, your kids know you love them? Many of the hands went down. I said, why don't, why don't they know? Well, I'm ashamed of what I did. Why does that have to have an implication on your children knowing you love them? I said, I want you to make a commitment today that your children will know every day you love them. So even men that are locked up don't have to be locked up in their heart, in their spirit. There's ways that you can take the essence of that dream, of that hope, and, and vitalize it just like that. And we have seen now we have evidence-based practice that you can uh, <laughs> now rely on, right? Because now that's, in order to get funded, you've got to do that stuff. But that's not the only thing that works. We must return to our traditions, to our ways, reincorporate it, and then send it out that way. That's a perfect, <clears throat> yeah. 
a perfect way into the uh, question that I have. Um, I have two nieces uh, that, those who know me, I don't have any children, but I always talk about how my sisters and brothers allowed me to have a role in their children's life, where these are their granddaughters. And both of them have become, one became a teen mother less than two years ago, and her older sister just had a three-month-old. And uh, I know they both were not at that point in those relationships to become wives and the fathers to become husbands. And I was talking to a group of Head Start parents, mothers particularly, because you know the, uh, it, the adage is that most of these young ladies now are without men for their children. And I said, one of the things you need to make sure your child knows is who they are and whose they are. Mm. But when I thought about the whose they are, I was thinking about that, that greater being of God, but it just came to my spirit that whose they are is also about the mother and the father and making sure they understand that. So when you just said what you did, some shackles we've got to help our young men and our young ladies to release, to take away the violence and the hurt and the pain, is to understand that that child is really the best of both of them. Mm. That's the first thing. But the other thing is that it doesn't mean that they really have to be forced into that husband and wife situation. They still can be mothers and fathers. How do we begin to teach that message? Because knowing this personally with my nieces, I thought about them getting those guys Father's Day cards. They are not in relationships with them. But even letting the guys know, you know, from the children saying that you, I thank you for letting me be the best of you. Because I thought about how much that would make that young man feel to move beyond this even to help my nieces understand that, you know, th they don't have to be your husbands. You know, we, I don't know what you call what happened, and we don't have to call it anything, but the child that came out of it, we've got to heal that for this generation. Then we've got to talk about it in a way that we heal it for the generations that you were talking about, because that's a lot of the hurt. Those are the ones that raised their hand and couldn't say they loved them, because we haven't shown them mm. how to love beyond having the baby without them being the fathers. Our, you talked about the institutions, the systems, they don't support that. Yeah. But I think if we're gonna raise our boys now, we got to deal with that issue to help the lady be there and the young man to say that this baby is the best of us and let's move forward. Then teaching them, giving them a space to love and to support, but to break off those shackles. Uh, so, you know, it's, I don't know what that a question, a statement, or whatever, but it, it is what it is. You know, <laughs> in, in traditional culture, in traditional culture, there, there are no orphan children. Every, every child is ours, right? And I remember a, a, a colleague of mine who shared, he went to Africa, and uh, he asked this young boy, where's your father? He said, he's over there. So who's that man over there? He says, that's my father. So who's that man over there? That's my father. He says, well, who's that man over there? That's, that's my father. So he went to, to one of the guides. He says, well, this young boy is saying they're all his father. He says, they're all his father. He says, but you see that man over there, that disheveled man over there? He went to war and has been wounded. He says, in our culture, everyone is his father. The only thing that man could give him is life. In Western society, we believe that only a man and a woman that bears you should be able to give you everything. And any of you that's a parent know we, we can't do it all. So if we return to the traditional way, we re recognize that all children are ours. And, and I have many nephews now that I say, you call me nephew. The problem is they want presents at Christmas too, but you know, that's a whole different thing. So if, you're not, if, you, if you can't, you know, really follow through with it, you shouldn't say it. We must return to a way in which we step up and we embrace all those children in that way and, and, and help them heal the wound. Sometimes that father wound is there. It's real important that the healing becomes a central part of the work that we do with men and boys of color. I'll just quickly add, every uh, major uh, religious tradition that I'm aware of has a very powerful narrative and, and uh, emphasis on taking care of the widows and the orphans. These are not uh, like multiple choice questions or you know, things that you can like you know, A or B or C or D, but if anyone is being true to their faith call and the traditions that I certainly participate in, you cannot do so and see uh, our children running around in the streets without anyone to care for them. Mm. So part of what I think we, as, as, as my brother has been saying eloquently, we have to recover 
these very important mandates that have been placed upon us as moral imperatives and not surrender our own success or narrative of success to uh, certainly a structure and a system that has been, as Brother Phil Agnew says very powerfully, working the exact way they've been designed to work. We must put our institutions and bring them into the fight and uh, lean into it and I believe victory then will become much more achievable for all of the things mm. that we're talking about today. Mm. We, have time. we have time for one more really succinct question and answer. <laughs> so it, but it's right back there. I'm sorry, my friend. Yeah, I believe the operative word you share here is morals. And my question to you all on the panel, how is it, uh, what is it, how is it possible for us as service providers to deal with the issue of morals in a society that profits off of immorality. Mm. It profits off of a reality show. It profits off of negative rap. Because one rap song can destroy what a thousand service providers do in one month. Well, I think, again, uh, we underestimate the power of our own voice and the power of our own proclaimers of truth. Certainly, uh, the kind of influence that we know uh, larger culture makers have um, cannot be disputed. And at the same time, I believe uh, that we still have very underutilized amplifiers of the kind of morals and, and uh, ethics that we all know to be true that actually create life. So I, I, I continue to push at least those in my kind of line of, bi of the business uh, to, to take our voices very seriously. How do we live a life that is more compelling than the lives of uh, those that may uh, celebrate the very things that we know to be problematic? And then how do we also make sure we are not participating in that very act of self-degradation ourselves? Uh, how do we make sure that uh, our lives are speaking louder than any rap song by the way we go into our communities when we do make it, right, and not move to the suburbs uh, because we're scared to be around Pookie and all of them, right? Uh, how do we make sure that the way we spend our money is not uh, the same way that the rap artists would spend their money rather than investing in uh, systems that actually bring about healing? I think there are ways that we can do this work that actually speak louder than words. And I believe the young people that I know and that I've met uh, are always compelled by that. Real quick story, one of the young men in our community that I was working with, we were uh, negotiating a truce between South Berkeley and North Oakland, and he said, Pastor McBride, I'm very glad that you're here, but when you leave, who's mm. gonna protect me? Mm. The police don't come when I call, they think I'm a criminal, the church won't let me in because they think I'm not holy enough. The schools won't let me in because they don't think I'm ready to learn and the jobs won't hire me because they don't think I have the skills. When you're gone, who will have my back? Mm. It was a very powerful question about institutions, about the roles that institutions play to embrace our young people. And I committed to him that we will carry his voice everywhere we went. And I think carrying his voice into the places like these are the ways that we change hearts and minds so his voice is not drowned out by the very problematic voices of those that are amplified in a negative manner. Yes, it's, it's important to mention in, in, in our history and culture is, is embedded in social action, that we must commit to live these values and live them in a good way, but we must commit to speak up and stand up for those that don't have a voice, have a lesser voice. We must commit from the values to action. My father said, palabra sin acción no vale para nada. Words without action don't mean nothing. You must carry this action to, to really change systems and change the way that our children are viewed and the way they're treated. The major question is, are our children valued? If they're not valued, then they won't be treated in an honorable way. We must make sure that our children are valued and they are treated in a way that is just, respectful, and with dignity. Thank you so much. Uh, can you give these two a hand, please? Now, uh, Brother Darnell Moore and Father Greg Boyle, if you could join us on the, on the platform. Uh, first, we'll hear from Darnell Moore on 
the, uh, an ethical framework for personal responsibility. Uh, and then we will hear from Father uh, Greg Boyle on a surprise topic because me and him didn't connect right before. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody. Unlike my brother here who so eloquently talked about moral memory, I'm gonna use my notes because my memory's bad. Um, I wanna start with my conclusion, and that is personal responsibility narrative, or at least this narrative that says somehow if you do good, be better, look better, that the outcomes that you will achieve in your life will be better is ineffective and limited and short-sighted. That's the way to start, right, with a conclusion. But why? Three stories. So at 17, I recall walking down the street in Camden, New Jersey, and um, I didn't have on sagging pants. I actually was dressed, as some people would say, properly. My pants were up and I had a belt on, something like I have on now. I wasn't rocking all of the gold. I had a little gold chain on. It wasn't like a big, what they called back in the day, the dookie ropes they called me. Y'all know what that is? <laughs> I didn't have that on. And I'm walking from my grandmother's house to my aunt's house in Camden, and down the street comes a cop car. Cop gets out, calls me a lookout boy. How many of you know what that word means, lookout boy? So the lookout boys in the neighborhoods were the one whose job it was to scream popo when the cops were coming. And you're supposed to tell the drug dealer so they can run. The cop put my arms behind my back, pushed me against the wall, put me in the car. I was an A student at the time. I was actually in a group called Institute for Political and Legal Education. I did what I was supposed to do, personal responsibility. But personal responsibility will not shift dangerous criminal justice policies like say stop and frisk that, has, uh, that, that relies on a, a racialized supremacy imagination that sees black and brown people as threats in our community. So personal responsibility won't shift dangerous policy. Second story I often think about is the one about my father who had me at 16. My mother was 16. People told him to do better, to be better, personal responsibility, to be a strong man, to take care of your kids. Sometimes he did that, sometimes he failed. And for all of the messages that he received, for all of the folk who told him that he was supposed to be better and that by him somehow being a better black man in our home, that our family will succeed, that didn't stop the physical abuse that happened in my house mostly every day. So he got the messages about what it means to be a strong black man, but it didn't stop the violence that was inflicted upon my mother's body. Personal responsibility won't keep us from harming one another. That is, it won't stop things like gender-based violence in our homes. The third thing that I think about is the fact that years later, I went off and graduated several times. I now wear suits like this, and I don't look like I did when I was 17. I've learned a lot, been through a lot of schools, but none of that success made me any less sexist, made me have any less misogynistic thoughts, made me any less homophobic, despite the fact, despite the fact that I would end up actually having a same-sex partner. Personal responsibility won't shift the ways that we even think about ourselves. So what then are the ethics that can guide us as we think about personal responsibility? What can we do better? And by ethic, and by ethic, and by ethic, I'm, I'm you throwing this word out here because we say it a lot. I mean that which is right, that which is loving, that which is just, and that which is equitable. The first thing I'll say is, that an ethical narrative of personal uh, responsibility connects the personal I to the communal us. We don't change for self. We are in community with folk, and we always have to be thinking about how we are situated in community with other folk. We have to connect the personal I to the communal us. When we do that, it helps us to focus on the structural conditions that impacts communities. Let me tell you why it's easy to focus on the I. Because when we focus on the I and when we focus on individuals, it keeps the focus off the real issue. You know what the real issues are? Structural conditions. Let's name them, because I don't like to talk in like basic terms. Racialized supremacy, sexism, rape culture, 
antagonism against homosexual persons, antagonism against trans persons. All of these things are the types of things that we forget when we place the onus on an individual or when we think that responsibility means that it's any of us walking down the street and doing our part as opposed to us doing that in community with one another. Secondly, there's this ethic that I was taught um, when studying in counseling school. They said to do no harm. You heard that before? The easiest ethic that you can think about is that one. Personal responsibility should lead us always to do no harm, but you can't do no harm if you don't know what the problems are. So how do we do that? My second point. You know this term intersectionality? Do y'all know that? Raise your hand if you know this term, if you heard it all the time. Aha, uh -huh. I think we emptied it of its meaning. So for many of us, it means it's an opportunity to analyze the interconnected structures like racism and sexism that organize in our lives to make life precarious for us. Guess what? It's easy to talk about the things that impact us, less easy to talk about the things that we are implicated in that impacts other people. I went to church too and, and studied as a minister pastor. So turn to your neighbor, y'all like that? Oh, no, I really want you to. And tell your neighbor, I need you to locate the I in the intersection. But I don't believe you. Let me tell you why that's important. Because I think many of us have done a very, very good job at analyzing the ways we are oppressed. That is, whose feet are situated on our necks. What we have not done is analyze whose necks our feet are pouncing on every day. So that means then, that means it isn't not, personal responsibility does not just mean analyzing and doing better so I can make the things that are impacting me better. It means taking the responsibility to be better so I can show up in community, not oppressing people in my communities. So now turn to your neighbor and say, locate the I in the intersection. I like that, I miss kind of being at the pulpit. The last two things I'll say is this, um, that this work requires us to be doing this daily, that it requires self-reflection and self-transformation. And I think as those of us who are working in community with black boys and men and black and brown girls and women, this work can't just end at five o'clock. That means I can't put together a program proposal and then walk away and act against the very principles that I highlighted in my program proposal. That means I can't talk about transforming masculinities if I'm still holding up sexist culture. That means I can't build programs on that's attempting to challenge and change our communities and have black boys and men be and think different if I'm the same black boy and man that I was before I, I even developed the program. We have work to do too. And your policies, the rubric that we all ought to be using is the one of ethic that I began with. Is it just? Is it loving? Is it equitable? And if we can't answer yes to those questions, then you're not being responsible. And in order for us to change the big issues, the sexism, the rape culture, the homophobia, the antagonism against trans folk, the class elitism, I can go on and on and on with these things then we all got to do some work of examining how we are implicated in all of those things I just named. And guess what you have to do once you examine that? You have to undo it. So I'll leave you with that challenge. Whose neck are your feet situated on? And what you gonna do to get them up? Thank you. My name is Greg Boyle, and I'm honored to share the stage with Darnell. Uh, I, before I flew up here this morning, I, I uh, talked to a homie at Homeboy Industries, a guy named uh, Louis Bettis. And Homeboy Industries is quite a large gang intervention rehab and reentry program, and about 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors, and uh, we run eight businesses. And he runs the bakery, and he was locked up about half his life heroin addict for a long time, now he's uh, in recovery, and he's a kind of a wisdom figure now. He's, he's an elder, I think. And so I said, well, I gotta fly, I'm going to Oakland, and I told him I'd come to here, I said, and he's become something of a good public speaker himself. I said, well, give me some advice, what, what 
what goes into a good speech? He says, you have to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. I said, yeah, no shit. Uh, he goes, that, that was wrong, wasn't it? I said, yeah, it's self-deprecating humor. Yeah, and he goes, well, I was close. I said, yeah, you definitely were second place there. You know, uh, there's an idea that's taken root in the world is that the root of all that's wrong with it, and the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. And Lewis's life on paper matters less than other lives. Lately, I've been studying uh, Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail, and he has this line in there where he says, we have to fight against the degenerating sense of nobodiness. And that's exactly right. Mike earlier said, you know, we belong to each other. Mother Teresa used to say that the problem in the world is that we've forgotten that we belong to each other. I get nervous when I heard the word, hear the word morality because a lot of times over the years I've been working with gang members for 30 years and people will say to me often, um, don't those people know the difference between right and wrong? And uh, not, not exactly reverent for how complex our world is and the day won't ever come when I am more noble or have more courage or have been asked to carry more than Louis Bettis has ever. So you stand at the edges of the margins with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless and those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And you stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. You stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. Everyone in this room stands exactly in the place I just described. Consequently, everyone in this room needs to brace himself or herself because the world will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. The only way to erase the margins is to stand at them. Look under your feet. They're getting erased because you've chosen to stand there. So no kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice, and it matters not how singularly focused you may well be on peace and justice if there, isn't, if there isn't an undergirding sense that we belong to each other, peace and justice can't happen at all. And so um, we try to uh, enlarge the circle of compassion and then we try to imagine people not standing outside of it. And we choose to dismantle the barriers that exclude. I, I've been taking a leisurely stroll through the Acts of the Apostles recently and um, you can read it as a, a quaint snapshot of life in the earliest Christian community, or you can read it, in fact, as a measure of health in any community at all. Things will leap out at you. Things like, see how they love one another. There's nobody needy in this community. My favorite one is this, and awe came upon everyone. It would seem that the measure of our health as a community may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So it was Father's Day and a homie came in to see me and uh, a guy named Miguel, 17, a very quiet kid who'd been locked up, came to us right away after uh, he was released. He went to our school because he was a minor. He worked part-time. He graduated from our school we have 115 students. And then he went on to Pasadena City College, and he works uh, in our bakery. He was standing in front of my door, and he looked like he needed to talk to me, so I, I called him in. And he, I said, what's up? He said, I discovered something today. I, I said, what's that? He said, I discovered that you are my father. And then he said, it's nice to have a father. 
I said, wow, uh, you made my whole damn day right there. I, I would have thought I won the lottery if I had a son like you. But it begged the question, and your own father, oh, he was never really there for us. I haven't seen him in like 10 years. And then you can tell when a homie is retrieving a, a slide from the family album, maybe something he would want to forget. He says, uh, I remember I was a kid, and my dad came home from work. And he told me how his father had rushed past him and then ran into his room, and little Miguel was playing with his kid brother. And his father stormed out of the room and was furious, and he said, who stole my batteries? Well, little Miguel had a toy that needed two batteries. He went into his dad's room, opened the door, found some batteries, put them in. I did. And his father went up to him. He grabbed his arm. And he snapped it in two. And Miguel was crying as he told me this. And he said, I was six years old. Yeah, it's nice, finally, he says, to have a father. And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. I had a, a, a homie in Houston who was really earnest and well-intentioned and former gang member and in the streets and born-again Christian. And he looked at me and he said, how do you reach them? I said, for starters, stop trying to reach them. See if you will let yourself be reached by them. And watch what happens. Exquisite mutuality. Watch what happens. You'll be fighting against the degenerating sense of nobodiness. And the soul feels its worth. And everybody gets returned to themselves exactly what God had in mind. So we stand at the margins and we hope that they'll get erased because we're there. And we brace ourselves because the world will accuse us of wasting our time. But in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And you've gathered here this afternoon because you want those voices heard. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you, Darnell. Thank you, Father G. Uh, we're going to open up for questions. We're going to start here with our other couple of panelists to ask a question and then raise your hand and we will uh, uh, bring you the microphone. Pastor McBride. Thank you for uh, your, your very powerful remarks. I am <clears throat> captivated by this challenge that you laid out, Darnell, about making sure we're not standing on someone's neck. And I uh, am also always challenged by Father G's remarks around kinship. And I wonder, um, do you see any interconnectedness around one's uh, assumption of kinship and, and one's ability to stand on someone else's neck based off of that kind of, uh, you know, assumed connection around kinship, if you get what I'm saying? Um, thank you. Um, um, this has been really moving to share space with you. Um, I think the, it, what makes it possible to oppress someone else, and I'm using this metaphor, standing on each other's necks to, to talk about oppression, what makes oppression possible is our inability to see others as human beings. Um, we see them as other, but certainly not as equal, certainly not as human being. Um, I think if we took on the notion of kinship, our family, uh, 
if we would do a lot better at treating people and seeing them as equals. I often talk about love, radical love. And I define love as the thing, the energy, that alleviates the space that would otherwise exist between me and somebody else. And I often will do this with young people. Like, stand up with me, please. I got the father standing, y'all. I got power today. <laughs> Can you go down there? <laughs> and I hate audience participation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but typically, this is what happens when oppression exists. There's a space between us, isn't it? Um, and I don't want that space to be filled. Radical love does this, walk towards me. That's what radical love does. And what we don't do is talk about radical love as political. And the reason why we don't wanna talk about radical love because we will have more people embracing than not. And that will pose a problem to the structural conditions that you brought up, wouldn't it? Folk don't want community. They don't want unity in our community. But we have to be better at ensuring that we're not replicating the type of oppression that keeps us from coming together. We can't change our communities if we're fighting one another. And if everybody's not at the table, if all of our people are not at the table. And guess what? The problems, that, this is why I talked about this notion of fight. The structures don't care. They don't want you. They don't want us to be in community together despite our differences. But when we can get over that and when I think we can use that radical love to connect, then we can be better at fighting the structural oppressions that are damaging all of us. You know, uh, in the old days, you know, I used to be more pissed off than I am now, you know. <laughs> and, and when I, I would speak, because in, in the old, old days, I, was, I, I buried 194 young human beings. There was a period of time when I buried eight kids in a three-week period. And, and a life in my community where I've lived for the last 30 years didn't count in Los Angeles. So I was pissed off a lot. And, and when I would speak, I realized that I was always trying to appeal to people's conscience. And now I don't do that anymore. I try to invite people to their own goodness. And that makes more sense to me, and it also works better. And... Uh, I know love is the answer, you know, of course, but tenderness is the way. Tenderness is the methodology. Love is the glass of water, and, and the homies that I'm privileged to work with or the, the folks that we want to invite them to their own transformation, the Isaiahs. You know, there's this dried-up old sponge. But tenderness is the point of contact. That's the water hitting that sponge. That's the most powerful thing there is. Uh, it, we have a school of 115 kids. They're not hard to educate. They're impossible to educate. But they show up every damn day because these teachers love them with the courage of their own tenderness. And no kid can learn from anybody who doesn't like them. And it works. And, and that's, I think that's why Homeboy works. You can, it's not a style of anything. It's, tenderness is why all of it works. And so tenderness is the thing that bridges us, that moves us to embrace. And, and I, we're accustomed to saying, you know, uh, uh, no justice, no peace. Or another version is to say, uh, if you want peace, work for justice. But we need to move, I think, uh, to this sense of uh, if you want peace and justice, you have to work for kinship uh, because they happen to be the byproducts of, of the fact that we're, we remind ourselves daily that we belong to each other, that we, there is no daylight that separates us, that there is no them, there's just us. And how do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we're separate. We've had some very powerful commentary around morality, and I'm just hoping I'm not going to be the only one at the bar this evening. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but you know, my, my question, or and I'd just like for you to just kind of touch on for a minute. You know, I don't have a problem 
you know, just standing in awe of the burden that poor people have to carry. And I think that's a very powerful statement. But I'd like for you to speak to just how do you cross that bridge or that gap, Darnell, that you spoke about when we're dealing with people who seem to be whole. Like, for instance, and I'll speak specifically, hope this doesn't get me put out, but talking about the people here, for instance. And one of the things that I often run into, you know, working with my staff, working with just brothers in the community, is that when we're all working with people who are wounded, we all come to the table and we can all get it done. But really connecting with brothers who have what we have or are on the same social ladder as we are, there seems to be a gap that's hard to cross. You know, we don't speak to each other the same. We don't uh, look at each other the same because we're so focused on the work. And it seems to be that's a place where I think the battleground hadn't been crossed. I think it's a lot of energy there that if we as educators or funders or just people who are on the same page, I'd like for you to just kind of speak to that. How do you cross some of those gaps and get brothers to speak to each other on the bus or at the subway or at the grocery store or wherever? Wow, um, a really, really good question. I, um, I think that when we begin to see, you know, so we're, we're here, most folk are here because you're, you know, some are paid, right, to do this work. Um, and what's the motivation for the work? Is it the paycheck or is it the vision that at the end of the labor that you are putting in, that communities are going to be transformed? I think there are two different things. Uh, they, can, they can actually go together sometimes. Um, but I think if, if the ethic is one, um, and if we're talking about ethics here, right? What is just, what is right, what is loving, what is equitable, then it means that we leave, when we leave the spaces that we're working in, uh, quote unquote working, the thing that you're getting paid for, that you carry the principles of that work into the communities that you exist in. Um, and I think that that is the harder work, actually. I think it's very, very easy to talk about love and justice when you're getting paid a paycheck to do it. I think it's less easy to talk about that when you got to be on a bus in Newark or Camden or Trenton or Oakland or anywhere else in this space. So for me, the challenge, that I, the way that I've tried to take that up is to live out my politics in the spaces outside of those privileged ones that I'm expected to. To do, you know that saying, like, it isn't what you do in, in, in the open, it's what you do in secret? So I've gone and do things. Like, I started a writing collective with brothers from across the country, cisgender brothers, that is, brothers who identify with the gender that they're given, and brothers who are trans, professors, formerly incarcerated folk, and we write together. We write letters to each other. Folk who are from the hood, folk who are living in the suburbs. Folk who got a lot of money, folk who don't see no money coming. And we write each other. No one sees that unless we publish it. We're not getting paid to do it. But it's been the best gift that I've received. And so part of what I think our challenge is, is after this conference is done, after tonight is done, the formalized conference, what you going to do then? How are you going to treat people then? How are you going to treat people when the grants stop? when the program's over. And I think when we can begin to apply our sort of our work ethic um, to our person and connect it with our personal politics and then live that out in the community, then we do the job of transforming spaces and ourselves. Uh, I, I just wanna, because I know we're running out of time. I, um, at Homeboy Industries, I, I'm, I'm not the great healer and that homeboy over there is in need of my exquisite healing. The truth is we're all in need of healing. We're all a cry for help. Uh, once I had a woman come to me and she says, I have to volunteer at Homeboy Industries. I said, why do you have to volunteer at Homeboy Industries? Because I believe I have a message these young people need to hear, you know. And I went, yikes, you know. Um, the minute you lose the message, I hope you give me a call, you know, because... Because I'm not interested in that. I mean, I, 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 uh, I had a reporter ask me once, how does it feel to have saved thousands and thousands of lives? I said, wow, boy, I sure don't know what you're talking about. Only thing I know for sure is that my life is saved every day. That I walk in there and it saves me from uh, self-absorption and, and uh, a confidence in my own cleverness. And, and it saves me from my own lack of courage. And I show up every day because I'm one of the most selfish people I know because I know that my life is saved there. 
That's the only thing I know for sure. And that saving lives is for the Coast Guard. I think we should probably stop, stop trying to do it because if, if you can just receive who people are, and that's why I, when you were talking about Isaiah, you know, it's not about saving him. It's about being the most privileged participant in his transformation, which happens to transform you and me, which is, again, another manifestation that we're in this together and there's no way around it. Uh, Cesar Chavez, somebody said to a reporter, said, wow, these farm workers sure love you. He shrugged and he smiled and he said, the feeling's mutual. And, and what we hope for is this exquisite mutuality where there is no us and them and there is no daylight that separates us. And I think we could begin by not trying to save anybody, but trying to, kids know that they're valuable only because you've received them. And that's the big disqualifier all the time. People come to me and say, well, I can't volunteer at Homeboy because I'm not an ex-gang member and I've never been to prison. Are you the proud owner of a pulse? That's all you need. That's all you need to be able to receive who somebody is, and that person will, will feel valuable because you've received him. If we don't cooperate in some way or collaborate. So, Ricky, Ricky, if we could bring the microphone up here. Um, uh, if you could just thank our panel one more time. No, 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 Mike, Mike. Have a seat. We're gonna, uh, in, in the spirit of, of, of really trying to focus on application and sort of so what and, and, and hearing um, um, a number of gems, we're gonna hear from Cherie Deans to just really uh, debrief some of what we heard and, and uh, challenge us to take it home in a certain way. Oh, when did, Cherie. When did all of you get here? Um, <laughs> So this is an this is an awesome res <laughs> this is an awesome responsibility, and I um, I hope that I'm able to capture what you left for us. But I'll, I'll start with Pastor McBride, who the very first thing he said is, "If there is a moral imperative, it comes from the fact that our young men are gifts." And at first, I focused on the gifts part, and then two seconds later, the if hit me. Um, and I realized that the jury's still out for our nation on whether or not our boys are gifts. Uh, and that's something that we have to work on. That we are obligated as people to transform structures and not just individuals. That disorganized truths cannot defeat an organized lie. And we all have so many truths, right? And so I hope over the next three days we can figure out a way to organize those truths to battle against the very, very organized lies, that we have to widen our circle of concern. And then he talked to us about proclamations, policies, and programs and the interconnectedness of those things and reminded us that our morals show up in all kinds of places, including our budgets. Next, we heard from Jerry Teo. I hope I got that right. Um, who spoke to us about his grandmother. And as he was telling us that story, um, it made me think about the fact that after we go down on our knees, will we give up and give, get up and give blessings and hope? And so we're down on our knees today and tomorrow and the day after. The question is, what will we do after we get up? Where are those grandmothers? Will we be the people that see past anger and see the hurt and pain? Will we connect to our past? Will we be people that believe that all kids are our kids? Will we be people that speak and offer truth and blessings? He was asking us if we will make true connections to our boys 
and then connect them to their sacred selves? Will we own all of them, not just the ones who look like us or who come from us? Darnell reminded us to think about the limits of personal responsibility and the way that we all drop into that narrative far too often as a reason for why our kids are not successful. He reminded us that no amount of personal responsibility will keep us safe from very organized lies. Um, he reminded us to connect to the personal um, and communal us and focus on the structure. To locate the I in the intersection. And then he asked us, whose necks are our feet on? And then I thought, whose oppression pays our paychecks? Father Greg said, we have to fight against the nobodiness which reminded me of Maya Angelou. We stand, um, that we stand, we have to stand up for the disposable so we won't throw people away. That the only way to erase the margins is to stand on them, which is an uncomfortable place. And that people might say that we're wasting our time, but we should be captivated and, dare I say, compelled by the challenge of compassion, kinship, and care. He invited us to get in touch with our goodness. So the question is, how do we create that space? The space for tenderness, the space for caring for our, our kids. And then I think what is the best quote of the night, saving lives is for the Coast Guard. <laughs>